Kathleen, why don't you co cover our upcoming programs? Okay, so uh, yeah, we're, we're waiting for uh, everyone to join. Welcome to those who did and to our guest speakers. We're really excited about this one today. Uh, so we just always like to let people know what's coming up. We kind of have some of the basics here. And so this is our monthly challenge webinar, and we're delighted to have our, our guests here today. On the first Fridays, we have roundtables, and you'll see we'll have some interesting ones coming up. And then we also have our diversity, equity, and inclusion chats and webinars. And on the right, you'll see some specific ones coming up. Um, on the 18th uh, is the DEI webinar series closing, but you can still join. Uh, it's kind of a summation, so I think you can join that. We have a roundtable on December 3rd, and the article that we'll read and discuss is posted. On December 7th, our, our last webinar for the year, Training for Critical Thinking the Right Way. We're really all good on that. Uh, we know that we're going to have microlearning in 2022, and we've got a few other interesting ones coming up. Uh, and on Saturday morning, December 4th, we have a Applied Skills Workshop, um, and that's about building your first chat bot. Uh, there is a small fee associated with that, but we're really excited about it. So please check our, our programs page about that. And we always like to, um, uh, well, I was going to say we, we have a second slide, but that's okay. Uh, we'd like to invite people who might want to uh, start building their brand as a, uh, you know, a professional expert kind of person. And, and ISPI SoCal can be an avenue for doing that. Um, and, you know, we could take little bits of help or lots of help. <laughs> You can always Amen. use lots, lots of different Amen. things you could do. So um, if you're interested, please contact uh, Vince Budrovich, our president, uh, president at ISPI-LA.org. That's kind of our old name, but that's the email. Or Vince at Performance Solutions Group, uh, com, And you, you can uh, see how to contact us from the website. So that's what we've got going on. And so, Suresh, I think you're going to introduce our awesome speakers. I have to unmute myself first. Well, welcome to the brave souls that uh, showed up here today. Um, we um, uh, probably more than eight to nine months ago, we had Tom Pratt from Crane Morley actually tell us and take us through um, uh, X reality and augmented reality and so forth. And we now have Tom back with uh, Troy Siegel from his team and a very, very special guest who goes by William Christie, but is known to everyone as Ron, the man with the big uh, guitar collection. Fake, <laughs> albeit. <laughs> so, but, uh, uh, it's actually it's William Cameron Christie, and Ron and comes. That's from where the Cameron. Ron comes from. Wonderful. There you go. Now I learned something new yeah. already. Um, so Tom mm -hmm. has been very active with ISPILA for many, many, many years. He was on our board. He's definitely been a big supporter is a great proponent of training, and especially when it comes to this cutting edge stuff, Crane Morley is a place to go. They've worked with uh, Mercedes, Mitsubishi, uh, and then of course, HoloLens technology. And we've had some very uh, interesting, wonderful live presentations at their uh, uh, office itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but now here is Tom back with uh, his team member, Troy Siegel. And uh, Troy, am I pronouncing the last name correctly? Close enough. Thank you. Close enough. The famous, famous name. It's spelled so many different ways. Uh, but you'll you'll hear a lot more from Troy, and of course from Ron, his experience with what they've been doing at SoCal Gas when it comes to augmented reality. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. And uh, any any further introductions or qualifications you want to mention, and then take it away. Yeah, so uh, Ron and Troy uh, at Sagali are the two smartest people I think I've ever met. So with that, I'm going to throw it to Ron. I think he's going to lead off here, share his vision, which is a transformational vision. It's not, not we're usually talking about technologies. That's just a small part of it. But uh, mm -hmm. anyways, Mr. Christie, would you please take over? Certainly. Um, I always have to remember to click include computer sound. And here we go. Yeah. Loading your presentation. Working out a few details. Slides will appear when they're ready. Wow, they're really building anticipation. All right, can you see it? <laughs> we, we've yeah, seen we seen them already, Ron. Wonderful. All right, so. 
Um, I've been with uh, Southern California Gas Company for about six years, and uh, that's kind of rare when it comes to the gas company. When I, most of my my colleagues have been there for a very long time, 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years. I have a gentleman in my department right now who's already retired twice and come back, and he's 80 years old, and he's just he's just a gem. Uh, so it's a company that uh, people stick with, um, but because of that, um, a lot of folks at the gas company don't know what they don't know when it comes to training, because that's the only place they've worked. That's the only exposure they've had to training. Uh, I, on the other hand, uh, have had a lot of jobs, so my my lack of job stability has been a uh, a plus in that I've been able to. Uh, experience a lot of different uh, possibilities and and uh, best practices that are 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 uh, done out in the in the various uh, companies I've worked for. So I uh, I w actually I started out as a high school teacher, then I was in the aerospace industry for about 14 years working on computer based training and military systems. Uh, and then uh, was with American Honda. Uh, for six years. I've been a, a college administrator as a dean of business and technology in several colleges. Uh, I've taught at Cal State Long Beach uh, instructional design. Um, and so so I've been in, in a lot of different areas. Uh, the most recent position I was in, I was the manager of training for the University of California at Riverside prior to coming to the gas company. And this is my last job. Uh, I've told my boss that at the end of this year, December 31st, I was going to step down from being the manager of training uh, to become a full time grandpa, guitar player and photographer. And uh, he said, well, you know, if you want, you can hang out here, you know, one, two, three days a week and work on some special projects if you want. So that's what I'm doing. So starting January 1st, I'm going to be semi retired and uh, uh, let somebody else worry about the day-to-day -day operations of the department while I get to uh, do some fun projects. So um, the natural gas industry has been around a long time, like the mid 1800s, and uh, they've really been doing training the same way for many, many decades. Uh, tr very traditional, and I've had an opportunity to serve on a number of different um, peer reviews of other gas companies uh, where we take a look at how they do training and uh, I'm just actually amazed that more stuff doesn't blow up uh, <laughs> because the way that tr training is done in this industry. Um, some companies really on on top of it. Some of them, uh, they, they want to put on a class, but they get bumped from a conference room because an, a vice president wants to have a meeting in there. And so they don't like this particular company didn't have any facilities for training. They always had to beg, borrow and steal. So uh, I feel very fortunate that we are uh, head and shoulders above most of the uh, gas companies I've been associated with. But uh, we have a number of challenges. Um, Workforce challenges we have, uh, like every industry, there's a drain of skilled workforce uh, because of baby boomers retiring and the, and aging infrastructure and growing regulatory requirements. Every time there's a incident, an accident or something occurs, there's more regulatory requirements. Uh, changing technology all the time, needing uh, training. Uh, increasing operator qualification requirements. Now, this is something in our industry where uh, if you uh, want to perform a particular task, you have to uh, have the operator qualifications to do it. And the, the CPUC may uh, approach you at any time, ask you for your for evidence of that. Um, training performed the same, and, and, and training's been performed the same way for 40 years. Uh, and it's basically classroom lecturing, and hands on, uh, we have a thing called Situation City. It's a, a simulated neighborhood with little sheds that represent houses, and we have all kinds of gas facilities people can work on. Uh, we can even light up a, an underground fire and they practice putting it out and things like that. 
But uh, more often than not, these lectures were simply reading gas standards to students, and they were calling that training. Um, so there's training challenges. We have out, out of date props and tools and equipment. It all costs money. Uh, lockstep scheduling is probably one of the biggest. When I say lockstep, that is where we schedule a class that has a start date and an end date on a calendar. And uh, the class runs uh, eight hours a day for week after week. Some some of our classes are only a week long. Some of them are uh, 11 weeks long, for example. And so uh, when we need to to hire folks for the field, they need to get into the to training sooner rather than later. And too many times I get a phone call from a field supervisor and saying, hey, when are you going to have your next fill in the blank class and I look at the schedule. So, well, not till uh, three months from now. That's unacceptable because it's lockstep scheduling that's hard, hard to not to do that. Uh, so uh, training demand exceeds supply. Um, uh, oh, uh, there, there's the priority seems to be to cover content rather than competence. So exam, for example, I would often hear the phrase, well, you got to you got to include this or you got to uh, make sure you cover this or you got to let's put this in the training because we got to we got to cover it rather than we got to ensure that these trainees are competent. So it's compliance over competence. Uh, it's really more like covering your rear. No coverage for sickness, vacations, or course enhancements. Some of our subject areas we only have one instructor for, so if that person is ill, uh, we're dead in the water. Uh, instructor recruitment is difficult because, frankly, they can make more money in the field with overtime than uh, as, as a management employee. <clears throat> and the cloak courses become bloated and lengthy. Like this is an extension of the cover the content uh, philosophy where, well, it, we got to cover this, so let's throw it in this class and just add it to it. And if somebody wants to know, because if something happens out in the field, they're going to want to know, did you cover it? And, and uh, well, yeah, we covered it, but it doesn't necessarily mean they learned it. Uh, and there's significant travel away from home uh, and the all the expenses associated with that. We spend millions a year on hotels and things for for trainees. But on the other hand, the other side of the coin, there's unprecedented opportunities uh, for innovation and productivity for a more tech savvy workforce. These young kids coming up are, are maybe they don't know one end of a wrench to or the other, but they do know technology. Uh, and we now have the technology infrastructure that we can deliver training just in time, anywhere, anytime. And we have the methodology to assure competence versus covering content. And I saw Rex Connor in this group. Are you there, Rex? Uh, that that should uh, have your ears perk up because uh, this covering this um, competence is straight from the MEGA approach. <coughs> uh, so we can virtually eliminate scheduling of training classes through self-paced instruction. Use of training as a strategic asset, not just uh, for job preparation. Uh, so often we'll have a, a, something happen in the field, and I don't care what industry it is, but senior management tend to use training as the first uh, uh, thing they'll throw at a problem, whether it's really the solution or not. Uh, a new view of training is competency development system. So we shift from training as an event to a system. <coughs> so let me show you what that might look like. OK. The through all of this, the primary goals that we're pursuing are to make training more readily available. You know, this problem of, of scheduling classes uh, with lockstep training is, is makes for not very available training. To bridge geographical boundaries, we we have employees that we prepare from uh, San Diego all the way to San Luis Obispo. 
shorten training time, make training more engaging, and ensure competence and ensure efficient instructor utilization. Um, we don't want to just use instructors to be reading gas standards. That's not very efficient use of instructor's time. So we're intentionally shifting the paradigm. And this is the most the common utility company training philosophy. Training is an inconvenient necessity. Uh, we got to get a bunch of people out in the crews, but uh, uh, they got to go through training. So uh, we're always getting pressured to add more students to our classes beyond the number that we feel is effective. Uh, because they just want to get them through, you know, just check that box. They've been trained so that we will we'll we'll tell them how to do their job once they get in the field. Uh, get them through the training as fast as possible. Uh, compliance based, like I said earlier, rather than competency based that we uh, check the box. We've, they, we we they, they sign a thing called a 5300, which indicates that, yeah, I've been trained. Therefore, I know everything. Um, and it, we, we want to get away from the traditional method. I mean, we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but uh, but the doing it the same way for decades doesn't work anymore. Uh, the got to cover it, got to go over it mentality, bloated training courses, lockstep training, and training limited to a training center. So we're going from this to training as a strategic asset. Training is directly related or tied to the job. There's competency-based training. Multimedia, we're using as many different modalities and media as we can. Training is laser focused on critical skills and knowledge. So we get rid of that over uh, bloated training. Training any place, anytime, where, for example, if they can do a portion of their training in their base before they even get to the training center, uh, that's preferable uh, for, for, for many reasons. But one, of course, is saving money. They don't have to travel as much. Um, and training starts at the time of need and ends when competent. So instead of training being represented by a date for a start and an end date, you can start any time. So the next time somebody calls and says, uh, when, when are you going to have this fill in the blank class? I can say, well, can you come on down tomorrow? Or maybe this afternoon, you got some time, you can start working on some modules, self-paced, individualized instruction. So we're leaving no stone unturned. For, so every single aspect of what we do from the administration, the scheduling, the sequencing and segmenting of training and the facilities, all the different classroom situations, city, the off-site locations and props, it's all part of a system. <coughs> And this, the curriculum, instituting a systematic instructional design development process that we didn't have before. Uh, we've started advisory committees. That's an idea I stole from the community college system when we used to bring uh, employers from, from our service area and we talked to them about what we're teaching their, their potential employees. And we do the same thing now with folks from the field. <clears throat> and then we use internal and, and vendor capabilities to develop training. Um, so we're we're not throwing out instructor led training, but we're adding e-learning, individualized, self-paced instruction, job aids, hands on, on the job training and just in time training. Uh, and then professional development We're we're constantly trying to sharpen the saw with our instructors. So here we go, Rex. CRI, a common philosophy and vocabulary. We decided that we needed to have a single philosophy that we can all rally around that seemed to make sense for our industry. <clears throat> and if you're not familiar with Robert Mager and his work, the late great Robert Mager, uh, his, these principles are based on instructional check objectives are derived from job performance and reflect the competencies or that is the knowledge and skills that we need for, for doing the job. Trainees study and practice only those skills not yet mastered at the level required by the objectives. Students are given opportunities to practice each objective and obtain feedback about the quality of their performance. 
and students should receive repeated practice in skills that are used often or are difficult to learn. And finally, students are free to sequence their own instruction within the constraints imposed by the prerequisites and progress is controlled by their own com competence or mastery of the objectives. So this is the guiding, these are the guiding principles for everything that we're doing. <clears throat> and this was particularly heartwarming when I saw this. This is a instructor who I, I refer to as our resident rocket scientist. And he took his instrument uh, <clears throat> um, uh, course, uh, instrument specialist course and mapped it out according to the CRI principles and uh, I was so impressed with this I sent it up to my director and he said I will fund the the re-engineering of that course because I mean it, it's just so cool and so so uh, gratifying when you see our instructors uh, take hold of this and and just take the ball and run with it so uh, this is how it would shape out as an as a system. We've got mentoring, on-site training, individualized modular, self-paced, structured on-the-job training, just-in-time, interactive classroom instruction, as well as leveraging all this technology and what we have, it's Situation City, which is our simulated neighborhood I spoke of earlier. So how would this look like? Here's just one potential hypothetical example, and and it, this it's infinite the number of possibilities that this would work out. So there's a, a training is initiated. So we, we somebody bids into a job. This is a union company, and uh, you you bid for the job. You get the job because you have the seniority, you have the qualifications. Uh, or some new technology has come along, or some regulation has come along, or some incident or performance gap has occurred. All right, so training is initiated. And then so they can immediately in, uh, enroll in the training or be assigned to the training through the LMS, and they begin training. So typically it starts with a course orientation. This could be synchronous or asynchronous um, via Teams. Um, or it could be completely canned uh, as a as an interactive lesson. Now they start doing some prerequisite modules. These are typically the cognitive objectives that they they do first. And this dividing line represents the field versus the training center. So they do the first few prerequisite in the modules, and now they need to come to the training center. They've gotten all the basic information that doesn't require hands-on and now they're in the training center and for lack of a, a better term i call this a hybrid model where they do a little piece of e-learning in our self-paced learning center and then they go out and do some hands-on whether that be a prop in a classroom or a lab or out at situation city and then well did they pass no or yeah or yes okay no that we remediate somehow maybe they'll go back through and do these modules again or instructor work with them individually or something like that but you can see how an instructor now is somebody who's standing by you instead of in front of you in a classroom lecturing but they're now uh, facilitating your learning so now they go through another hybrid module uh, some e-learning and some hands-on and then uh, they passed. Well, say yes or you know, you know, yes, maybe so. Let's so we do now. They they don't have to be at Pico Rivera for a couple of weeks. They can go do do their their training at their base, and then uh, at some point they go back to the training center, and there's maybe a group seminar or a team's classroom discussion or something like that, and then they do some hands on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's only one, like I said, one example of how this might work. So this training delivery continuum is could be completely 100% self-paced e-learning or completely 100% traditional classroom and hands-on or something in between like performance, uh, electronic performance support, structured OJT and some form of blended learning, augmented reality, virtual reality and hands-on. So we have to map all of our curriculum for ma to make this work just like you saw that example of earlier. One second. <clears throat> yeah, I thought since it, since 
YouTube was launched through PowerPoint, you'd think it would keep showing it. Yeah, I don't think Teams is that smart. Um, and I have the sound off. I figured we could just kind of talk to this while it's going. But um, here we have like kind of like a highlight reel of some of the examples of what we did um, with the e-learning. So we worked closely with the instructors um, because I don't know if you guys caught what Ron mentioned that one of the staples of the way training was taught was to read the gas standards to the students or have the students take turns reading the gas standards and uh, a gas standard is basically a something in between a legal document and a training document where it kind of lists out the procedure like the the worker in this in this environment or in this scenario the worker shall use the tool in this specific way and if the pressure is this the worker shall do this this and this so they kind of have them read line by line through the procedure and they have them highlight and they might you know talk about things like that and we're like okay let's let's try to uh, upgrade that a little bit so we started with some of the gas standards and just saw what we could do to bring those to life and that was really our first kind of step with e-learning is let's just make these into videos, let's make these into pictures so that the gas standards kind of come to life and they, they follow along that way. Um, so here's an example where they're showing a process that not only is it, again, kind of taking a, a text only gas standard and making it pictures and video, but what's even better is this is something that um, you can't really demonstrate very easily to the classroom because when they're down in a pit like this, yeah, you could have the class kind of hover around and look down inside, but they're not going to be able to see much detail. So this is an example where something like e-learning or a video really shines because you can get the camera uh, up into that specific equipment. You can highlight it with, with things like that. Um, and then this this is based what we're showing right now is basically a video just kind of showcasing some of our examples. Um, this is another good one where we worked with the instructors to really make it not just again, here's what you need to do, right? Because the gas standards say this is what you're supposed to do. And this is how you do it. Here we actually test them on it. It's like, okay, you just read what to do. You just read how to do it. Now let's make sure you actually know what you just read. So this is uh, a good kind of simple case of, you know, co uh, competence versus covering, right? So we covered it. Now let's see if you're competent, if you could do it. And here again, we kind of, brought it to life a little bit where we show some examples of exposed pipeline and now the user or the worker needs to look at different examples and then judge it. Is it good? Is it fair? Is it poor? Just by the picture and then they're given feedback um, on what defines poor, what defines fair and then they, they know if they're right or wrong. So we make it more interactive. Um, here's another cool thing you can do with e-learning as a medium that is kind of tricky to do with with video where we have this really complicated thing where even if you're staying in front of the equipment you might not be able to see what's happening but they're in some instances that they're learning the equipment they're learning the procedure they're learning the regulations and they're and then they're also learning some math or some some laws so here we're kind of trying to put everything into one to where they can play with it this little simulation on their own so what happens if i increase the heat how does that affect the pressure how does that affect all the other variables and so this kind of helps them learn um, with a little bit of a visual uh, enhancement here and we try to so interaction is, is is a big one that we really try to always focus on so they're not just looking they're they're actually interacting with what they're with their with their training medium here's another yeah, example where the, when we started this project i i told uh, tom and troy the I really don't like to seeing a lot of next, 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 next. You know, so so there's a lot of manipulative things that the students can do with this. Yeah, exactly. So instead of them just hitting next, 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 um, which again is essentially what they would be doing if they were back to reading the gas standard, they would just be going from one page to the next page. But here it'll stop them. And it won't it won't even let them progress like there's no next button. They have to put in the right information before they can proceed. Um, this is a really good one where this looks like a simple picture, right? Just like a picture of some houses and some numbers. But this is something where every single time um, they had to teach this, they had to draw this on the whiteboard. Um, they drew it from scratch every time and they're trying to just make up scenarios on the spot. 
And uh, this is now self-paced to where it's more sophisticated of here's a real life example. If you have this leak in this area and there's a street here and there's a house here, then is that now a code one or a code two or a code three leak? And we, the the way that they had to pass them before is they had to basically just run the student through these over and over and over and over again, just drawing on the whiteboard until the whole class kind of got it. And now uh, to Ron's point, we can kind of take that out of the classroom, have each student go through just a bank of these scenarios until each of them become competent to where they can pass them on their own. And now that frees up the instructors that that just streamlines the class because if one student does it fast, they can move on to the next one. And if one student does it slowly, um, they can take their time and, and get more scenarios. Whereas before the in the classroom environment, the, the class only moves as fast as the slowest student. And again, the instructor needs to keep kind of just drawing on the whiteboard and making up examples on the spot. So these are example. These are kind of scenarios where e-learning can really help elevate the uh, the experience both for the uh, student, but also it benefits the instructor because they have better. They can kind of use their time more effectively. And then obviously for SoCal gas as well, because it um, gives them more more time. And then Ron, I'll pass it back to you unless you want me to show a different video. No, that's that's fine. Um, Actually, do you want me to throw up the PowerPoint? I could just you could just tell me next slide. Um, well. Uh, I've got it. Oh yeah, here it is. I Touchpad is not working well though. There we go. Here we go. All right. Now I gotta go back to where I was. Well, what the heck happened? Well, maybe you should. <laughs> can you go ahead? Yeah, because that yeah, that way I can I can switch back to um All right, videos quickly if you want to show more videos. All right, this is so good. So we were here. All right, so you're going to change for me, right? Yep, so just tell me when next. So we just did this oh, one. Yeah, go to the next slide. And I actually right. just walked through some of these, but I don't know if you want yeah, to Yeah, these are, these are just a bunch of uh, links to samples that we had. All right, so now we're also, uh, thanks to uh, Crane Morley's encouragement we've been dabbling in the augmented reality world and uh, this is our vice president gene orosco with that uh, hololens on and you you had an example you're going to show that right troy yes okay go ahead so yeah so um this is so we just talked about e-learning as a, as a medium and using video um and things like that to kind of elevate the learning to uh, something that the students can kind of take anywhere at any, any time, um, even on their phone or a tablet if they don't have a computer. But here now we're we're taking the computer and putting it on their head. Um, and the benefit you get from doing that is your hands are free, right? So if I'm doing e-learning on how to replace a valve, um, I may need to go sit at a computer, um, watch a video, take e-learning, then I need to go out and do it. Uh, what's cool about the HoloLens is this brings all that into one flow. So now I have my instructions uh, in front of me while my hands are freed up and on the equipment. Um, so there's kind of two two notes we're trying to hit with this, which is one is um, is training, but another one is uh, real time collaboration. So let me show that first. Um, so in this example, uh, when COVID hit the instructors were having a tough time uh, trying to teach, you know, hands on, so to speak, right? So previously, um, all the students would come out to a job site um, and the instructor would show how to use this equipment. So this kind of helps them find and locate a uh, buried pipeline. And with the hall lens on now, the class, all the students can be remote. So in this example, we have three students back at home but they're able to watch through the instructor's eyes. So the instructor is now wearing the hall lens and they're able to kind of tag along in real time. They can see what he's doing, see what he's seeing, and he's able to just speak to them and kind of explain how the equipment works. Um, and beyond just show and tell, um, when the instructors are, you know, kind of good, which, which fortunately we worked with a lot of smart instructors, 
they're able to say, OK, what do I do next? So in this example, um, he throws up a map and he has this, the students circle where each piece of equipment should be. And he's like, OK, is that where it is? All right, I'll walk over there. And so then he walks over to where the equipment should be. And fortunately, the students were correct and he found the equipment. So that kind of teaches them how to navigate a map. Then he gets there, he's like, OK, which one do I put on next? And he has the students kind of use him as an avatar and they kind of walk him through what to do. So this way you can get a whole kind of room of people um, close up, uh, eyes on the equipment, even though they're all remote and could theoretically even be in different states. Um, here he is doing it again where he's kind of getting guidance on how to do this valve changing uh, procedure. So they can walk him through it um, and he's able to again bring a classroom of up to, you know, let's say 50 people even uh, close up hands on and everyone can participate. Um, um, and, uh, yeah. and really join the experience. And this is done via remote assist, which is basically. You put a team's call on your head. So that's one example of how we're kind of using the Hollands to to augment training. Um, here's another quick one that I'll show where the instructor is doing a meter bypass with the students uh, watching in real time. So again, he's standing there. He's looking at the gauges. He's like, OK, guys, if I'm reading this much pressure, um, am I OK to shut this valve off now? Yes or no? And they have to kind of respond and they have to walk him through it and he'll let them make mistakes. And it's it's pretty cool. So. Um, and in some ways, again, this is even better than in person because there are times like, you know, previously we showed him in a pit where even if the class was physically there, they wouldn't be able to see uh, the detail that he's seeing. Like, right, if they're, if you have a big class, there's probably some students in the back of the crowd that aren't seeing the gauges. They're not seeing what valve he's turning. So this is a way where he can get a pretty big class and they can get up front and they can see everything uh, well. So when they do get hands-on, they kind of already know what they're doing. So we've gotten a lot of, uh, uh, fruit from just putting putting these on the instructor's heads. And then another example I wanted to show is guides. So got, that was remote assist where that's basically remote collaboration where you do a team's call from your head. And then for guides, this is more, um, uh, it's easy to just describe it as e-learning, but in your in your workspace. So here's an example where if this were, this is like his instruction step and it's telling him what to do next, which is to pick up the crescent wrench. So here again, instead of taking the training and watching the instructions first, then going out and doing, he's doing while learning. Um, so he's learning in the flow. So this is kind of directing him with holograms and with instructions and with video and pictures, but he's actually on the equipment hands on. Um, he could be out in the field. Um, and now he gets to actually learn um, how to put it together. So he's getting the muscle memory. He's he's doing it. So when he finishes when he finishes this training module, not only can he say, I think I know how to do it. He could say, I know how to do it and I did it right. Um, and this can uh, really streamline uh, the time because now again, instead of spending uh, 30 minutes or an hour learning how to do it and then spending 30 minutes or an hour doing it. He can just do it in all at once um, and the instructor can. Um, even be watching remotely, right? Because um, the instructor can kind of patch into his headset. So this also. Gets double benefit and that the, the instructor gets freed up a little bit as well. Um, so these are like the two main platforms we're using for the hall lens, which is remote assist and guides. And uh, we're we're cooking up a lot of cool stuff here, and and the instructors have a lot of really uh, cool ideas on how to use this. But um, like Tom mentioned, this is just one piece of the pie. So I'll go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So um, changing uh, the way we do things requires a change in our facilities as well to be able to uh, to uh, implement some of these ideas. Now this is a picture of our former um, uh, uh, lobby area and uh, 
it was ugly and a bunch of uh, antique stuff sitting around and we didn't really use it much. So now what we've done is converted it to this, where uh, we have a self-paced learning center uh, equipped with computers. You can see these, there's no computers in these cubicles at the moment, but, but they have them there now for students to do those, what I was calling uh, uh, hybrid modules where they do portion of it as e-learning and then they get up and go out to uh, the Situation City or to a classroom or someplace to perform the hands-on portion of the, the lesson. Um, oh, I'm, I'm trying to change the slide. <laughs> it's you got control. Uh, this is a video actually. You can go ahead and start it. Um, you know, COVID was kind of a blessing in disguise for us in that it really accelerated our implementation of some of our technology driven training and Microsoft Teams has been a real plus. Uh, this is a guy here. I just happened to walk in the room there and I started shooting this with my cell phone uh, and he's teaching a class entirely through Teams and it's worked out very well for us, especially when we combine Teams with the HoloLens, as Troy has already shown. Okay, next. Uh, virtual reality, this is a uh, scenario that they're having to deal with. It's an uh, emergency response where we've got uh, a pipe that's uh, broken and blowing and ignited, and they can go around to the, the house and knock on the door and tell the, the owner to evacuate and all those kinds of things. Next. And then finally, this is uh, actually a project I'm going to be working on in my semi retirement. Um, this is a QR code project where let's say you've been through training and you're now out in the field and you're doing your new job and it's been about six or eight months now and you come across a piece of equipment that you were trained to do to use in training. But shoot, I haven't touched one of these since I was in training. I can't remember. So, oh, there's a QR code on that piece of equipment. You you scan it and up pops a video, shows you how to uh, set it up or use it, and what have you. This is exactly how I fix stuff around my house. You know, I look at look it up in YouTube, try to find the most authoritative source. But so this is this is going to be a whole bunch of videos that uh, Crane Morley has already shot for our e-learning. I can repurpose for this as well as shooting a whole bunch more. Uh, as well as video as, or, or, you know, PDF documents or whatever kind of resources needed in the field. And I think that was the last slide. Yeah, oh, well, I, I can't forget this. Um, we won five uh, awards in, in, in partnership with uh, Crane Morley for digital communications. Uh, so that would be it. Well, I guess we open it up to questions now, huh? Yeah, we do. Good. We have time for a few questions, I think. Uh, just jump, just unmute yourself and jump in and ask the question. Go, Irvin. Oh, look I'm at not. that, 12.44. We're almost perfectly on time. Yeah, right, um, yeah. So actually a two, two part question. One is, can you talk a little bit, a little bit about what's different in your approach to understanding customer needs, given that you have this kind of uh, capability now, versus before. And then the second part of this is all this new kind of uh, capability that you have leads to a lot of interesting innovation possibilities. So for example, what you showed about the QR code, right? How did you find out how to do that or that you could do that? Or were you, how do you find out what other people are doing that you might use? You know, it's funny, um, almost everything that we've been implementing, I've stolen from someplace else. <laughs> the the uh, self-paced individualized instruction is right out of American Honda where I used to work. And they've been doing this for over 30 years um, as far as the self-paced and no scheduling in classes and all that. Yeah. Um, I, I put, uh, I put the, a portrait, I'm a photographer. That's one of my passions in life. And I've done a portrait of all of our instructors. There's 
and and all of their pictures are on the wall. I call it the wall of fame. Stole that idea from, from UC Riverside Medical School, where they had the professors on the wall. Uh, but as far as um, uh, as as um, determining what, what our clients need, what what are the training needs? Um, now with our advisory committees, this has been a huge plus because we're in constant communication with the field and we follow up uh, after training our instructors go out to the field and uh, kind of shadow our their trainees and uh, make sure that they're doing uh, well after training. And uh, we do surveys at the end of each course. Um, so, but the main thing is communication, constantly participating in in uh, district meetings and and the advisory committee meetings. And what was the other part of the question? The, the, the first part was really about oh, the QR uh, code. instructional design. Yeah, the QR codes. Uh, I stole that from Enron. Uh, I was at a, a conference, actually Mosaic, one of the uh, companies that uh, is very big in the the uh, utility industry. Uh, they put on an annual conference and I and I've met some folks that through that and uh, they did the QR code thing there, uh, but they didn't they didn't need a vendor or anything. They, they just did it uh, very. It's very simple to do. There's a you can get the fr free QR codes dot com or something like that. And but I've I've engaged uh, Mosaic to create a a nice app that's going to run on the mobile devices and create a database system for me to populate with videos and uh, other other resources. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I I tried I tried to take ideas from different industries and apply it to the gas company where it's never been done before. It's it's really kind of fun. Yeah. Other questions from someone? Yeah, Ron, this is Kathy. I just <clears throat> had the observation, you know, I worked in technology, so people's uh, hands, they, they already had their tool, right? They had their laptop um, or their phones or whatever it was they were using. But it was fascinating to hear you talk about the same kinds of problems that, that raise the need for this transformation, like, uh, keeping travel out of minimum or, you know, getting the leadership to not, you know, require crazy things that aren't going to really lead to competence. And it, it's really more of a comment than a question, but it was just fascinating to me to hear the same problems. <laughs> and and what and the other thing I guess I would say is what what really helped you make this transformation happen? Because you have to get the leadership on board, you have to get all your stakeholders on board, you have to get funding, right? So um, yep. What do you think really turned it for you? Was it COVID or? Well, I, you know, you know, you've heard the phrase, um, "A prophet has no honor in his own country." And, oh, yeah. and when I came aboard the gas company, I I was this alien from from the the aerospace and auto industry and higher education and that sort of thing. And I've never done anything except training and education in my career, my entire career, and so. Uh, I was fortunate in that they took me seriously, and um, I am a bit of an evangelist when it comes to this kind of stuff. And I gave countless presentations all up and down the food chain, all the way to the executives. Um, and then along came SB thir SB 1371, which is a Senate bill in the state of California that has to do with emissions. And so leaks that we wouldn't bother of fixing in the past, we're going to have to fix, or some leaks that we would take in longer to fix, we're going to fix sooner. And it has to do with controlling emissions. And there's 25 best practices, one of which, best practice 13, has to do with training. And it's a very, very vaguely written uh, best practice. And it uses the word performance based training. And I, view that as being synonymous with criterion referenced training yeah. uh, or the I see Rex head bobbing up and down. <laughs> uh, and so I wrote a proposal of how we need to implement that best practice. And I thought, well, what the heck? 
you know, you never know until you try. So I wrote this proposal for $2.3 million and lo and behold, we got it. And so that was the leg up to be able to identify all the curriculum that has anything to do with emissions and take those first to radically transform and uh, uh, overhaul those courses using that resource. Uh, we also, um, in, in California, we have a thing called the, the uh, Employment Training Panel or ETP through the state of California, which um, is intended for helping California companies become better, more, more pro, uh, competitive with especially outside competition. But since the gas company is a big employer that helps people raise their standard of living and all that, we qualified. And so I, I got a contract from the state of California for like a hundred well, no, $298,000, I think it was, uh, for basically doing what we do anyway. And I just had to track the, the enrollments. And so we got money through that. And so what's nice is that having this extra money to do all this stuff, we can create some, uh, some really outstanding examples that I can then show to the executive and say, see, pretty cool, isn't it? You want more? <laughs> so, if you want more of this kind of stuff, we're going to need some resources. And, and that's been happening. Like, for example, I showed uh, that um, course map that our instructor did for the instrument yeah. specialist course. Yeah. Uh, as soon as my director saw that, he said, man, I want to fund that. We're going to make that happen. So, so you know, when they see results, and, but the seed money was really the key. That, that's that's an amazing story. Were you have you been able to show um, reduced costs and travel for training and those kinds of things, or even capture some of that and bring that into these efforts? Well, that you're doing? yes, we we're able to we're at pretty accurately project it, but we aren't at the point yet where it's uh, you know we're firing on all eight cylinders and this is fully in operation, if you know what I mean. So wouldn't be accurate quite yet. Fascinating. Ron, Ron let me ask you one other question. Uh, how about the workforce? Presumably uh, before HoloLens and some of these uh, um, online e-learning solutions, it was more traditional, get in the truck, go, go learn in the classroom, go out and figure it out with somebody showing you how to do things and so forth. Was there resistance to switching to HoloLens and other of those kinds of tools? You know, um, surprisingly, no. Uh, I, uh, I've i been very fortunate in that regard. I've had almost no uh, resistance that I can think of, but uh, I really credit that to a lot of communicating. And I really wanted to show the instructors that uh, yeah, it's going to be different. Your job is going to change. You're not going to be the sole uh, pontificator in front of the class, the sole source of of all the fount of all knowledge. You're going to be more of a manager of of a training system and a facilitator of learning. And what, so that 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 went over pretty well. Pretty much. What what about the students? Uh, it's been very well received. Um, we've, in, you know, during COVID, we we hadn't had we did hadn't loaded all of our course material into the LMS, so we were running it off the cloud, and I mean, we just we just implemented because it was a urgent situation. We needed to do distance learning, and through that experience, letting them use this material was a great pilot, actually. And, uh, and and it they they really did enjoy it. Thank you. Just fascinating. Any other questions? Um, um, this is Jana. This, Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um. So hi everyone. My name is Yao. Um. Yao Huang. I am a doctoral candidate from Florida State University. Um, I'm being okay. This is like a comment is first of all, this presentation is really amazing. Um, the course part that reminds me of thinking in the, in the in the past years where I worked at International Paper, I saw similar e learning courses. But what fascinates me is the, the mobile performance, the performance support tools with the QR code, 
and the augmented reality technology, which is happening to be the two research projects I'm working on. So the the, the mobile I mean, with the QR code that's happening for into my dissertation study. Um, and the augmented reality technology is the one I'm planning to do next. So this is more like a request to see is after this presentation, is it possible for me to contact maybe Roy and Choi to ask more questions about, I mean, for the purpose of doing research? Um, because recently I published my very first publication through performance improvement. The title is called Using Mobile Augmented Reality for Performance Support. But that is more like a concept paper talking about the benefits, the, um, the challenges, but my, in my research project, I would like to dig out more. So right now I'm at the phase of trying to reach out for more participants and see maybe who is, uh, has the interest to help to grow the research in this area. So thank you so sure. much. Sure, but w I would welcome that. And I didn't catch, where, where are you from? What university? Uh, Florida State. I'm oh, based okay. in Tallahassee, Florida. Oh, yes, yes, great. Thank you. Sure. We Sorry, can't hear you, Vince. You're muted. Can't. Thank you. <laughs> you Sorry. I was going to say, in the middle of when you were explaining some of the videos, you just in a practical sense talked about the tool, and I loved your expression where you said, putting the computer on your head so your hands are free. To me, that was the most practical explanation of that when I try to explain it to someone else, because that's precisely what's happening, and that's what enables all the things that Ron was going through and describing. But thank you for that simple seat of the pants explanation. Yeah, the uh, the hall lens I think is the one of the first headsets we've seen where it's it's light, it's easy to use, um, and it's kind of crossed that line of it's not a future cool thing. It actually is usable today, yep. and I think that's one of the reasons why. Yeah, great use of technology. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, sounds like we've uh, exhausted our audience of questions. I uh, <laughs> want to thank you all for a absolutely a fascinating look inside of what uh, SoCal Gas are doing. Um, uh, Ron, I totally agree with you that this is a page out of the Honda uh, playbook and also a, <laughs> a, 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 a chapter or two out of uh, Bob Mager's materials that both uh, both subjects, both uh, sources that I really appreciate. And it warms think, my heart too. Yeah, <laughs> I think, amen, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think we can uh, call our meeting to close and uh, thank you all for joining us. It's been just fascinating. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay.